Hello and welcome to the review of chapter 53 of Guyton and Hall's medical physiology textbook. And today we get to go over the sense of hearing. So how a sound wave is able to be transmitted into a nerve impulse and processed in the brain. If you enjoy the video, please don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you're in need of the textbook, there is a link in the description. If you're wanting to support the channel, then you can do so through the Patreon link where you can get access to downloadable audio files as well. So as with everything, we have to start with anatomy. So this is actually showing what happens within the ear. So you can see the ear here, and then we have the canal, and then we end up at the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. Now this tympanic membrane kind of vibrates whenever sound waves come into the ear and it's kept nice and tense so then it's able to vibrate with sound waves through the tensor tympani muscle. Now connected to the tympanic membrane is this little osseous structure and there's three of these osseous structures, so the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, that are all connected to one another. And they all vibrate along with the tympanic membrane. And the main purpose of these guys is to actually increase the force that's created to then push the fluid that's within what's called the cochlea. So the fluid within here, obviously fluid is a greater inertia than air, so we're creating the movement of air into movement of fluid. And then that movement of the fluid is then sensed by these little nerves and goes out via the cochlear nerve. And then that cochlear nerve then gets interpreted as sound. And that is really the real basics of how you are able to hear. Now just to go over to some other structures shown in this figure, these semicircular canals here, there's three of them, they're related to our vestibular apparatus and balance, etc. We will get to that in later chapters, so kind of ignore this top portion. So this oval window is exactly where the stapes connects and is able to transmit those sand waves into more Kind of almost like water waves and that is compensated for through the round window so as the stapes pushes in the round window pushes out and then that gets transmitted through the cochlea through the scalar tympani the scalar vestibuli and the scalar media as well so these three tubes within the cochlea and as you'll see we'll get it into the dissection of, of this particular region in the next page here but it's important to see that this is almost like a snail's shell, kind of wraps right around. So it's a nice long tube. And then interspersed within this tube is these little nerves that come out and form the cochlear nerve to then go towards the brain. So if we do a cross section through multiple of these sections, then we end up with this kind of image where we have this cochlear tube innervated by these spiral ganglion nerves that eventually form into the cochlear nerve. And then if we break that down even further, we have one of these cross sections right here. So we have the scalar vestibuli, we have the scalar media, we have the scalar tympani. Now in between the scalar tympani and the scalar media is this organ of corti. And this organ of corti is ex exactly where the sound waves are heard and transmitted into a nerve impulse. Now the difference between the scalar media and the scalar vestibuli is just the composition of the fluid. Now the fluid of the scalar media kind of supplements the organ of corti, but in terms of the transmission of wave sounds, it is the same going through the scalar media and scalar vestibuli, they're almost the same tube, so it goes down through them, and then it comes back through the scalar tympani, as you can see in this bottom one here. So the stapes pushes in, pushes almost like a sound wave through, and then it's transmitted through the organ of corti, or that we'll dive into more details soon, and disrupts this basement membrane through the middle here, which is right between the scalar media and scalar tympani, to then get transmitted back to the round window that kind of buffers that movement of the fluid within there. And as you can see, if we kind of separate that out even further, a high frequency sound will result in a disruption in the basement membrane very early in the cochlea and then eventually dissipate, whereas a lower frequency sound results in a disruption in the basement membrane further down in the cochlea, which will then dissipate. So that's the basics of how we're able to differentiate a low versus a high frequency sound through just the length at which that frequency is able to be stimulated in the cochlea. Now, 
uh, one thing that I did forget to mention all the way back in this paragraph is that we do also have another muscle called the stapedius muscle. And this muscle along with the tensor tapini muscle is able to almost protect our cochlea from extremely loud noises. So it's able to tense up, stop those osseous structures so that malleus, the incus, the stapes from moving too much so then we're able to not destroy our eardrum from an extremely loud noise. It's also to able to completely mask those low frequency sounds in loud environments so we're still able to kind of communicate. So moving forward now, this diagram is showing that for this one particular frequency, what happens with the movement of the stapes. So as the stapes goes in, we end up with the movement of A, whereas when it goes out, we get the movement of B. So the entire shaded region here is just showing us the amplitude pattern of this particular vibration. So this is what's going to stimulate the organ of corti, and we'll get to that very next, and then result in a nerve impulse going to the brain. So if we blow up this organ that transmits these sound waves into nerve impulses, we can see it all here. So we have the basement membrane, we have outer hair cells, and then inner hair cells, the inner hair cells are actually directly connected to our cochlear nerve through the spiral ganglion. And then we have this top little portion here called the tectorial membrane, which is almost like a gel, which these hairs are stuck in between. Now, if we simplify this even further, we get into figure 53.8. Now, as you can see, these structures all sitting on the basal fiber of the basement membrane. Now, this basal fiber will actually change in structure as you get further down the cochlea. We're closer to the stapes or the start of the cochlea. These are going to be shorter and stiffer, so they're able to vibrate better with higher frequency sounds. But getting further down the cochlea, they can become longer and limber, so then they're able to move with the lower frequency sounds. So when you move this basal fiber due to the particular nerve impulse, you actually result in a lateral movement of the reticular lamina or this top structure. So the lateral movement of this guy will actually result in these hairs which are stuck in this tectorial membrane moving relative to the actual hair cell. So obviously if this is going to move this direction, the hairs are stuck in the tectorial membrane, so then they're going to move in the lateral direction. Now that lateral movement actually results in depolarization or hyperpolarization depending on the direction. And then that constant depolarization and hyperpolarization then is sent through the spiral ganglion and through the cochlear nerve. So clearly if we're going to have a certain wave frequency move a certain basal fiber, so say it's a low frequency fiber, moving the long limber fibers further down the cochlea, then we end up having these particular hair cells moving, getting hyperpolarized and depolarized, resulting in signals going through the cochlear nerve, saying that we are currently hearing lower frequency sound. And that is mainly controlled through our inner hair fibers. Our outer hair fibers don't seem to play a role in terms of transmitting a signal through our auditory nerve fibers. Instead, they seem to tune our inner hair cells. So they almost control how much movement and how much stimulation of these inner hair cells have when a particular sound frequency is occurring. So it's almost like this lateral inhibition that we keep talking about from the spinal cord, where we're able to fine tune the signal that we are hearing. So if we define what the place principle is, which is described in this next paragraph here, the place principle is just saying that due to low frequency sound getting heard you know, further down the cochlea, where this high frequency sound is stimulating an impulse at the beginning of the cochlea, that spatial orientation is maintained within the cochlear nerve and gets to the brain, and then that is able to correspond to the particular frequency. So that's just saying what the base principle is. It's spatial orientation from the cochlea. So loudness, obviously, if something is super loud or something is very, very quiet, is able to be determined through three main mechanisms. First, just the amplitude of the vibration of the membrane. So if it's louder of a particular frequency, it's going to result in more amplitude of the vibration at that particular point on the cochlea, and that's going to be heard and result in more rapid action potentials. The second is that it results in more hair cells on the fringes of that resonating portion to result in the 
a greater spatial summation and a greater frequency of signals once again. And then third is the actual stimulation of the outer hair cells. And the stimulation of the outer hair cells with a greater loudness results in interpretation of the signal being loud. So you're basically stimulating these outer hair cells that shouldn't usually be stimulated unless there is a loud sound. There's this brief paragraph here talking about how we're able to actually interpret a very wide range of sound waves, or at least sound intensities, and that has resulted in us creating the decibel unit, where a tenfold increase in sound results in one bell, and 0.1 bell is one decibel. So it's a logarithmic scale for our hearing capabilities. And our frequency range of hearing is also dependent on the loudness of that frequency. So for instance, you may have a particular frequency that you can hear at a certain decibel, but if it goes below that decibel, you're not going to hear that wave frequency. And that's shown in this image here, where we have this threshold of hearing, and we're able to hear all of these frequencies from 20 to 20,000, as long as it reaches this particular loudness or this particular decibel. So for instance, for 500 frequency, you need at least a 60 decibel of loudness to be able to hear it. And this is what changes with age. So you actually need a louder sound, a louder decibel in order to hear a certain frequency. So now that we know how that sound wave gets turned into a nerve impulse, where does that nerve impulse now go? So it goes through the cochlear nerve, which is our cranial nerve 8, into the dorsal and ventral cochlear nuclei. The majority of them then actually cross over and then terminate at the superior olivary nucleus to then travel travel via the lateral lemniscus pathway and terminate in the nucleus of the lateral lemniscus. They then pass into the inferior colliculus where it then synapses followed by one final synapse in the medial geniculate nucleus before being sent over into our primary auditory cortex via the auditory radiation. And this auditory cortex is within the temporal lobe. Now we do have a lot of collateral fibers. For instance, we have collateral fibers going to the reticular activating system of the brainstem, which is involved with actually waking up the central nervous system due to loud sounds. But we also have some collaterals going to the vermis of the cerebellum. So if there's a very sudden loud noise, we're able to quickly react and move our muscles. The cerebellum's all involved with proprioception and standard reflexive movements of our muscles, as we'll get to in the next unit. And remember that we have this spatial orientation within the cochlea, which is maintained all the way up to the primary auditory cortex, so then we're able to tell what's a low frequency sound and what's a high frequency sound. So we have these two regions to this auditory cortex, and it's located within the temporal lobe, or the lateral temporal lobe. So we have the primary auditory cortex or receives the bulk of its impulses from the medial geniculate body and then we have this association cortex as well which primarily actually receives its impulses from the primary auditory cortex now remember we're talking about that spatial summation and that is maintained to our cortex where high frequency sounds typically are at one end and the low frequency sounds are at the other end as shown in this figure and that involves both the primary and association auditory cortex now the function of the association auditory cortex isn't to actually interpret sounds, it's to actually associate that sound information with other sensory areas of the cortex. And that's shown by people who do not have these auditory association areas, they're unable to actually interpret the meaning of a sound. So for instance, they may not know the meaning of a word, even though they're able to repeat the word, repeat the sound, they just don't know what that word means. And that is mirrored by the actual function of the entire auditory cortex itself, where the primary function of it is to actually create these tonal and sequential sound patterns. So how are we able to actually determine where a sound comes from? We're able to do it through two main directions. Number one is our horizontal direction, and that's just through the time lag of that sound entering our right ear versus our left ear, and then also the intensity of sound in the right ear or the left ear. So if there's a sound coming from our right side, it's going to hit our right ear first and at a louder intensity than our left ear. So we're able to interpret that it's on the right side of our face, obviously. And then another way of where sounds are coming from, through the quality of sound entering the ear because of the shape of our ear itself, or the pinna. And the shape of the pinna allows us to actually determine the direction of where the sound is coming based on its quality. And what happens is that that information of which ear the sound 
reached first and which intensity actually gets processed in our superior olivary nucleus first, where our lateral superior olivary nucleus determines the difference in intensities, whereas the medial superior olivary nucleus determines the time lag. And then that information is then sent up to our auditory cortex for processing and association for where that sound's coming from. So if you lose your auditory cortex, obviously you don't know where that sound came from, but the whole processing actually occurs in the superior olivary nucleus. And then lastly here we talk about some different types of deafness. We can have deafness due to an impairment of the cochlea, the auditory nerve or the central nervous system, so that's nerve deafness, or we can do it due to an actual dysfunction of our ear itself, and that's a conduction deafness. And that can be determined through an audiometer that you listen to and it gives you a particular frequency at a certain decibel, and if you lose the hearing at a certain decibel, then you're able to interpret whether or not you have any hearing loss. Now in old people, you actually start to lose the higher frequency sounds due to damage of the base of the cochlea, but you do have these other types of deafness, for instance, the loss of low frequency sounds due to excessive prolonged exposure to very loud sounds, so say being in a rock band, or due to various drugs, so such as streptomycin, gentamicin, chloramphenicol, these antibiotics, which actually result in drug destruction of the organ of cortex, so produce a deafness in that manner. You can also get fibrosis of the middle ear and kind of clog up all of those osseous structures which are meant to be transmitting that sound and result in a deafness that way. So that's the end of the chapter. I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to leave a comment, otherwise we'll see you in the next video.